without further ado, I'll introduce our uh, presenter tonight, Damien Moise, who is the resident energy expert at Renew. Welcome, Damien. Hi, Rob. Thanks very much for having me. No problem. Uh, so I'll take it, leave it for you to share your screen and take it away. No problems. Thanks, Rob. And yeah, thanks everybody for having me in your uh, lounge rooms and home offices and what have you this evening. Uh, I will just try and share the, uh, the PowerPoint that I've put together here. So, yeah, thanks very much once again. Um, yeah, going to try and cover a lot of different aspects of sort of home energy uh, use tonight. Um, so yeah, thanks to Rob and, and uh, other people for kind of chipping in as to what, what um, some of the topics we uh, need to cover. Um, these are kind of the four main areas. As, as Rob said, I'm gonna talk for about half an hour. Um, I always like to kick off with just uh, uh, how to get a better deal generally out there. Uh, mo most of the things you can do in and around your own home for energy, most of them, you know, they cost something. They, they cost a lot of, they don't cost that much and they, they cost a bit of time and effort as well. Whereas, um, yeah, sort of changing retails doesn't cost too much at all. So it's worth touching on that. Um, we're going to talk a bit about solar and batteries. I think a lot, lot is known about solar, but provide a bit of an update uh, around particularly battery and kind of battery integra integration stuff uh, with solar. And then kind of get into a bit more detail around kind of your major home energy uses and, and therefore costs, and then get into some, uh, some uh, opportunities, I guess, in terms of thermal comfort and energy saving tips and yeah, particularly with a bit of a, a lens of uh, COVID and working from home as a lot of us are, uh, are doing at the moment and also try and provide some, some tips for renters too. Um, so how can you find the best deal? Um, yeah, very quickly. I mean, now I think there's, you know, there'd be more than a thousand <laughs> different retail offers, tariff offers for electricity and probably the same amount for gas in Victoria. There's a lot of retailers offering Victoria. It's not just a... Uh, an issue of just ringing one or two retailers and seeing what they offer. You've really got to use uh, what we call the tariff comparator websites and we really favour uh, across the country the government ones and in Victoria that is the Victorian Energy Compare website. Um, the, the web address is there at the bottom. Um, you, you go to that, I mean the reason we, we prefer those is because they actually provide most of the offers in the market um, whereas that's not always the case with the private ones. Um, you simply go to that address, uh, look for either electricity or gas or both offers and answer some questions about your, your house and your energy use and it'll automatically pull, you know, the top 10 cheapest annually offers you can, you can compare. Uh, so really worth doing. If you go there now, Daniel Andrews will pay you 50 bucks just for going to the website, even if you don't change retailers. Um, and as I say, it's something you can do for free. We often quite easily find people we work with 100, 200, 300 the other day are, we work with a lady who found her $600 worth of savings a year just by uh, changing retailers, so worth doing. Um, the other side of the coin is if you are really struggling with energy bills, particularly with energy costs, your energy use going up in this kind of working from home period and the, the bills are starting to get a bit too much to handle, Victoria does have pretty good energy concessions framework, concessions being a, re a rebate reduction in your bills for eligible uh, you know, generally more lower income, vulnerable um, energy customers. Uh, it's run through the Department of Health and Human Services. So again, the web link is there in the middle and yeah, really encourage people. You can get a bill credit of, of, of about 20 to 30% off either electricity or gas bills with that. Um, so we would generally su definitely suggest you have a look at that. Okay, solar and batteries. Um, I think generally, you know, knowledge is pretty good among people now around how solar works in particular. This is just your classic solar graph. The, the blue line um, is, is really showing you um, uh, kind of a typical household energy usage pattern and your electricity usage that is, and your solar uh, generation curve in the middle there. Some of the solar generation is used on site and some of it's, quite a lot of it in, in many cases now is exported to the, to the grid. Um, Adding a battery to that, what does it look like from an energy uh, flow, energy management point of view? Well, some of that solar that would otherwise be exported to the grid gets, gets charged, gets put into a battery for use later on, generally during the evening peak, this yellow bit here. And even if there's enough left over in the battery, it also might be used uh, all night and even in, into the next morning peak as well. Um, and overall, the amount of exports to the grid will reduce and your reliance on the grid will, will significantly reduce as well. Um, 
Solar, solar PV, you know, the, the technology, very proven now, been around for a long time. The economics have been very good for a long time. To give you a very quick, broad idea of economics, you know, medium system sizes are around the kind of five to six kilowatt mark, uh, depending on where you are and some of the rebates going around. It can be, and some of the, the different types of design that you use, it can be between about four and eight grand installed, save around a thousand to two thousand a year off your bills, you know, pretty good payback times, and it actually has a significant carbon benefit, you're, you're, whether or not the solar is used in the house or next door, it actually does displace uh, emissions from the grid. Um, battery is a bit more difficult, particularly on the economic front. Um, certainly proven technology, a lot of the products on the market, but they are more, more recent, not, not as long a history in Australia, certainly. Um, economics are harder, you know, the, the, again, looking at a medium sized system, you know, eight to 10 kilowatt hours of, of sort of storage, you can be looking at anywhere between around eight and 15 grand installed. And the amount of savings that you get is not quite, when you add a battery to the solar system, it doesn't sort of double whatever the bill savings you're gonna get from the solar. Generally, our analysis kind of finds that it's more in the hundreds, maybe up to sort of four or $500 a year if, if you've got a large enough uh, electricity usage. Um, larger homes do benefit more from batteries than smaller usage homes. Um, but it's worth bearing that in mind that, you know, purely economically, and particularly in Victoria, where we do have lower tariffs than a lot of the rest of the country, uh, the economics can be challenging. Um, and the CO2 side, the environmental side, is we get asked about a lot. Um, it's a bit of a mixed picture, but generally, you know, the starting point really is that solar actually generates, you know, renewable electricity, whereas battery is not a, not a generator, it's storing existing renewable energy. So it, it's not creating new renewable energy, therefore it's not directly uh, you know, reducing um, the, the emissions associated with electricity usage at home. It's essentially just shifting when that electricity, renewable electricity is used. Um, at the same time though, it's worth making the point that you know, if we're gonna have high levels of penetration of renewables in the grid, we're gonna need lots of storage and household batteries is, is going to be one component of that. So at sort of a macro scale, we think it does have uh, at least an indirect environmental benefit, which is worth considering. Um, yeah, the other aspects of batteries, sort of non-economic ones, obviously uh, backup or blackout protection is a really key driver, particularly kind of more in regional areas, like a lot of our uh, people listening in tonight, that might be an issue for you and, it, and might be a good reason to consider uh, a system that can actually provide you backup capability. Um, you might have restrictions on how much you can export to the grid, in which case the battery can help. Or, and that might be to do with, with high voltage in your local street. Um, or again, your grid connection may not be sufficient and upgrading it uh, might be expensive. Certainly if you're off grid, upgrading it could be very, very expensive and, and batteries in that sense start to come into their own more and be a realistic proposition. Um, and of course, if you grab one now, you'll, you'll be certainly in the, in the early adopter market. Uh, it's worth touching on rebates very quickly. Um, obviously, there's the federal government rebate uh, or incentive, the small technology certificate incentives. That's been around a long time. It's pretty automatic. Generally, it discounts or discounts all solar systems by about 20%. Uh, the Victorian government, though, for the last couple of years, has had an additional rebate uh, for solar PV and for efficient hot water systems and for battery systems. Uh, the solar PV one is almost an additional two grand, about 1800 bucks. Uh, the hot water rebate, which is actually really good and quite undersubscribed, uh, provides a thousand dollars rebate to solar hot water systems and heat pump hot water systems. And these things are available to renters as well, if you can talk to your landlord and, and negotiate uh, that. Um, and then there is a battery rebate as well, which is significant, up, up, up to almost five grand, but it is postcode based. Um, and my understanding from Rob is more of the postcodes now are in some of the areas that uh, I suppose are relevant to the CVGA, um, but you would need to log onto the SolarVic website there, have a look, see if your, first of all, your postcode is, is eligible, uh, and then if you meet the fairly broad eligibility criteria about household income and, and the value of the property. Um, Another quick point to make on batteries. One thing to bear in mind, we're, we're kind of really interested in where electric vehicles are going in terms of batteries and whether or not uh, what's called vehicle to grid or vehicle to home technology really comes in, into Australia. So this is where you might be able to use, if you have an EV, you might be able to use that car battery to supply electricity back to the house to run the appliances in the house. Uh, that, that technology exists, it exists in the world. 
Um, it doesn't particularly exist though in our energy market in Australia at the moment. The rules around that are quite unclear. Um, but we think probably in the not too distant future that will become, um, you know, something, uh, an available uh, practice. And, you know, you can start thinking about the potential for electric vehicle batteries, which on a, on a cost basis per unit of, of energy stored are actually cheaper than, than household batteries. Um, but this might be a way, depending on your driving patterns, to actually uh, have, a, have a battery system that can provide both your transport and your home energy needs uh, in, in combination. A um, couple of final slides on solar batteries. Look, it is one, one point to make is that it is always different for every home. Uh, how much you'll save, what the right system size is for you, what the right technology is for you is different depending on a whole range of different factors. Um, it is worth getting independent advice. It is worth trying to get a sense of what's actually worth putting in to start with, what's the right inverter type, what's the right battery configuration. Um, we do that at work through Energy Consults, if that's uh, ever of interest to you. There are also some other independent organisations around that can do that sort of assessment before you then start getting quotes um, and start, and, and I mean, with, with our uh, system, we also help people assess those quotes as well. So if you're needing that kind of additional help, um, uh, that, that advice is certainly there. Um, I'm assuming uh, this presentation will, will probably go out from Rob afterwards for everybody, will probably PDF it, and I've included links in various parts of the presentation that people might want to refer to. This is a page of relevant kind of battery links, both from Renew, but also from uh, the Clean Energy Council and, and some other uh, good, good on, online um, uh, sources for, for good battery information. So please feel free to, to use those. So, uh, that was all I was going to say about solar and battery stuff. Happy to, to talk to people uh, in the Q&A session uh, more about those things. I wanted to, talk, to start to get into what are the real major household, the, the major drivers of, of household energy users and costs, uh, um, so that we can start thinking about where should we really be focusing. Um, first point to make is, well, you know, Australia's a big country. We're, we're all in Victoria, I think, tonight, so that's good. We can kind of localise it a bit, but... Um, you know, the, the kind of advice that we provide in central Victoria is not the same sort of advice that we provide in Brisbane or Broome or somewhere else. Um, this is a pretty typical breakdown that we think uh, a Victorian, uh, Melbourne, but also a Victorian home would have in terms of the amount of energy use um, that's used by different appliances or different end loads. And this is irrespective of whether it's gas, wood, electricity, what have you. This is just pure energy use. Um, and what we find nine times out of 10 really is that heating and hot water in most parts of Victoria are the big two. Um, for us, when we look at lots of people's bills and, and their, their situation, really half to, to three quarters of, of Victorians energy use comes, comes back to heating and hot water. So it's really about focusing initially on, on those two. You can do lots of other things in lots of other areas, but they're gonna make a much smaller difference in terms of either reduction in energy or, or reduction in cost. Um, we deal with hot water first. Um, people are probably familiar with the different types of hot water systems that are out there. Um, slide there just talks about your non-solar ones, electric storage, instantaneous, and then gas storage and instantaneous. And then you've kind of got your greener options there. Obviously, solar hot water has been around a long time. Uh, heat pumps and solar electric I'll talk about in the last few years has come along a bit more as, um, well, really sort of challenging solar hot water, I guess, as, as renewable alternatives for hot water. Uh, instantaneous is pretty straightforward, um, either gas or electric instantaneous. Essentially, there's no tank. You're not storing hot water, you're just uh, heating it on the way through. Cold water in, hot water out. Most of these are, are actually gas instantaneous units, and those ones are the, the most efficient, low cost of all the gas options. Uh, there's a bit of electric instantaneous around, but uh, it's not, not anywhere near as, as common. Um, your storage units, obviously, there's a tank, you're heating up water at certain times during the day for use later on. It might have a gas burner uh, in terms of heating that water up or it might actually have an electric element or two. Um, and yeah, fairly straightforward. Uh, other than that, both the gas and electric storage technology is very uh, much older traditional technology. Um, you've got solar hot water systems, which again, have been around a long time. Obviously there's, there's collectors, panels on the roof that are catching that sun to heat the water up either directly or through, through an antifreeze. Um, you can have those flat plate glass panels like we've got there or the evacuated tube ones, which are more efficient, but do cost a bit more. 
Um, and then the configuration is generally either the panels on the roof and the tank on the ground, uh, what, what's called a split system, or uh, a tank on the roof with the, with the panels on the roof, so close, close coupled, and, and that one uh, doesn't actually require any kind of active pumping to circulate the, the water. Um, what's really come along in the last kind of three to four years is heat pumps. So heat pumps, are, it's the same technology as, as reverse cycle air conditioner technology. It's using a compressor and a heat exchanger to, to create lots of units of heat on, on the output side. Um, it, as, as it says in the slide there, it works a bit like a fridge, but in reverse. Um, the key thing is that these things are very efficient, um, just as reverse cycle air conditioning is. It can create, uh, with hot water, can generally create around up to four units of output heat for heating water for every one unit of electricity that you put into the system. Um, it is kind of a solar-based technology. Essentially, you're using solar energy from the atmosphere to, uh, in, in combination with the compression, compressor and the heat exchanger to create that heat. Um, and these things have really come a long way in the last five to 10 years. 10 years ago, we were pretty sus on them, to be honest, but the last five years or so, we're actually, to be honest, uh, now kind of favor these a bit over solar hot water for, for new installs. Um, they work in all weather conditions. I did live up in central Victoria for a while and had one that worked perfectly all year round. Uh, they work down generally in minus 10 degrees, fairly low noise now, and they're very low power. Um, they integrate very well with solar, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and then your other options are kind of your, your solar with electric options. So trying to run your solar as much as, as trying to heat your water, sorry, as much as possible from solar PV. Um, this can be done in an off-grid arrangement. It can be done sort of directly um, using the DC electricity from the panels with an inverter and just directly trying to heat an old electric storage tank. Um, or it can be done using particularly heat pumps and a lot of the heat pumps have timers so they can be timed to run during the day, come on at 10 or 11 a.m. and then the solar will generally be generating at that time uh, and generally a lot more, most solar systems now are a lot larger than one kilowatt and that's what most of the heat pumps draw. So for most of the year, if you have a, a reasonable size solar PV system with a heat pump hot water system, um, you're pretty much getting free, free hot water. They're, they're sort of renewable ratio goes a lot higher than the, the kind of traditional solar hot water systems do now. Um, this kind of table is just here really for, for checking out later on, but you know, there's lots of different things to think about with all of these options, you know, costs, energy usage, running cost, and then of course their carbon impact, and they do vary a fair bit. Um, you know, if one point to make is if anybody's running these things on bottled gas, generally that means very expensive <laughs> uh, gas usage and also high gas use. Um, your gas storage and your electric storage ones, um, upfront costs for those technologies are generally, you know, low to medium, but their energy usage and running costs are fairly high. Your renewable ones, obviously, are the ones that, you know, they can sort of cost-wise are sort of in the medium to high price bracket. You know, heat pumps can be sort of three to four grand and solar hot water can even go up from there, but then they end up with very low or sometimes zero uh, hot water running costs if you're running them from PV. Um, and then you, in the gas options, you know, your gas instantaneous still remains of the gas options, your kind of lowest upfront cost and, and, and efficient in a gas context uh, and therefore relatively low use and probably direct competitor to, to, to the uh, renewable options. Um, other quick things, simple things you can do, uh, low flow shower heads still remain if you haven't done those or you, they're not as efficient as they could be, they still are a great way of reducing uh, both water and energy use. Um, pipe insulation, really kind of important and useful. And this little gadget here called a valve cozy, which you may have come across or, or not. Um, it's essentially a little cover for the pressure valve on the outside of hot water systems and stops the heat escaping uh, from that valve. Uh, the, the people that make it uh, suggest that it, it, um, it saves around 7% um, of the energy input into the system um, and they're fairly cheap to, to buy and easy to install. Um, if you need more information about hot water uh, systems specifically, there's, there's lots of information on our, abs, our website. The best thing we have is our little e-booklet, which is only a $5 download and gives you all the details you need. Um, we've got buyer's guides freely available on the website and then again, there's a number of other uh, good information sources online as well. The other one, Heating and, and cooling, really for, for a Victorian context, it's really heating I'm gonna focus on here. That's kind of the other major user that we uh, need to talk about. 
and why is that the case? Uh, well, it's really got to do with our homes and got to do with, with heat transfer and heat loss. Um, generally speaking, you know, most of our homes out there are very, very leaky in lots of different ways in terms of heat either leaking out of, of the building, uh, particularly in the wintertime or coming into the building in, in the summertime. And um, that's got everything to do with, you know, floorboards and gaps around windows and doors and chimneys and vents and exhaust fans and all these kind of things. Um, which, you know, if you spend more time looking around your house, generally the more time you spend, the more gaps and, and uh, cracks and vents that you find. Um, and, you know, essentially that we, we spend a lot of energy heating and, and to an extent cooling our homes and a lot of that, that energy is wasted. Um, it's worth quickly making the point that newer homes are better than older homes. So uh, newer homes, really any home that's, post 2005 built should have been built to the minimum uh, energy performance requirements in the, in the construction code and so should have a lot better performance for, for heating and cooling and those standards were improved in 2010. Um, but essentially if you're, in a, if you're in a home, you know, 15, 20 years old or more, a classic kind of weatherboard or similar Victorian home, it's likely to have a lot of gaps that, uh, and a lot of air leakage that you're, you're um, uh, hopefully able to do something about. Um, so what can you do about heating and cooling? Or well, really it's about thermal comfort and there's lots and lots of different things you can do. What we, what we generally like to do, rather than hopping into gadgets to start with, we actually like generally to ask people when we're working with them individually a few questions. Uh, and that is to think about how you actually use the house. You think about how you actually use each room. Um, what are the most frequented spaces in, in the house for you or for the, the total number of people living in the house? Um, do you actually, what sort of heating and cooling do you want? Do you actually want whole of house 24 seven, particularly heating? Or can you actually look at using spaces a bit smarter? Can you zone rooms? Can you look at, um, you know, partial kind of uh, house heating solutions? Um, and I'm gonna give you an example here, just it's a basic floor plan. And it, it sort of asks the question, you know, how do you actually use each space? And this is kind of really topical in the current environment where we're all living in. So this is just your basic floor plan of a two bedroom house. Um, you know, you look at this and you go, well, generally in most homes, kitchen, dining, living spaces are kind of your primary heating zone or your primary temperature control zone, where a lot of the time you're, you're trying to keep that temperature range within maybe, you know, 18, 18 to 22 degrees or something like that. Um, you've then got some secondary heating zones, which are often bedrooms and maybe a study um, and then you know, bathrooms and en-suites and these kind of laundries, you know, kind of fall into generally fairly minimal, minimally required heating zones. Now, the current context, of course, is that a lot of us are working from home and so rooms within the house are changing roles. Uh, and so then we're actually spending more time in certain rooms than others. Um, if you're like me, that you, you're working in a home office out of a bedroom and a, a room that hardly spent much time in before, suddenly spending eight or 10 hours a day. And so thinking about how you want to, to temperature control and where you want a temperature control to start with before looking at gadgets is a good start. Um, for those more frequented spaces, obviously, you know, you, you can start to look at those specific rooms. So, you know, it's, it can be a big project to look at the thermal efficiency of the entire building. But if you can pick off a few rooms and go, right, well, these are the ones we're going to actually concentrate on first. You know, you can have a good look at them, have a good look inside them. Obviously looking for, you know, the gaps under the doors. Uh, you're looking for the wall vents. Wall vents are an interesting one. Um, very, very common. Obviously they were there for, you know, when we had things like open wood fireplaces and uh, your sort of unflued gas heaters and that sort of thing. Most homes aren't running uh, heating like that anymore. And so these, these uh, the, the wall vents kind of really um, have outlived their use by date and can actually be sealed up. Um, and of course, around window frames is, is a classic. Um, what are we trying to really achieve overall? When we think about kind of thermal efficiency to start with, you're really trying to achieve a box, a sealed box, whether that be at a house building level or at a room level. Um, a, a little bit of air change um, is actually good, uh, just for uh, general sort of human health and the staleness of the air, but but really uh, most of our homes are actually changing the, the air in it up to sort of 15, 20 and even 30 times per hour, which is totally 
unnecessary for, for health benefits. And so you're trying to seal up that uh, more as a, as a box. Um, obviously, there's lots of little things you can do, and this is where you can kind of get into the DIY stuff, and it is things that renters can do, a lot of these things. Um, you know, a lot of the products for, dra and we're talking about draft sealing here, a lot of these products are readily available, um, you know, Bunnings and Mitre 10 and these kind of hardware stores, around windows, around doors. Um, there's a number of different options for sealing up vents, um, you know, using your kind of filler stuff or actually boarding them up potentially on the outside of the building. Um, and our floorboards as well, like the, the sort of pictures got there, you can start looking at, uh, if, if, if your floorboards are anything like mine, they're, they're extremely old and, and they actually leak a lot of air through the, through the floor. So there's some initial things you can do there which are, are low cost and DIY. You of course can get those things done professionally and a lot of the professional uh, ones that will be done will be done quite high quality. It will cost a bit more to do that but then you're getting professionals to come out and possibly install draft sealing measures that will actually last uh, longer than perhaps some of the, the simple uh, gadgets that you'll get from the likes of Bunnings. Um, curtains and helmets, great idea, particularly in winter. Um, you know, big, long, heavy set curtains really help. Most of us living in homes are single pane glass and single pane glass is not much better than having nothing there at all uh, as compared to, you know, a wall uh, when it comes to, to heat transfer. Um, purpose of the helmet really, as you can see in the right hand side of the image there, is to prevent that warm air that's been put into the room from your heating system to go back down the, the back side of the curtains and straight out the window. Um, putting the helmet there stops that and tries to get that warm air recirculating back into the room. Um, other little gadgets, little ones I'm going to put up in the next few slides. Draft stoppers are a, a very good one. These ones, there's lots of these uh, different types of products around, but essentially they're there for exhaust fans and vents. And whilst you know you need to use exhaust fans in bathrooms or kitchen when you need to use them, 99% um, of the time they're not in use and they're actually just another gap in the wall or in the ceiling. Um, and so these things essentially cover up that gap. They close the gap, uh, but they of course have open, openable generally lids um, that will open once you actually decide to use the fan. Uh, vent directors, another classic one, a good one that renters can do. Uh, these things typically associated with kind of your, your floor gas, gas ducted under floor heating, got the vents in the floor. The vents are generally on the edges of the room and often directly under windows and you push the heat out and it goes straight out the window. Uh, these things actually direct that heat more into the centre of the room and get a better circulation, a more even distribution of the, the uh, heating airflow coming in. And again, very, very cheap uh, and something that you can do yourself. Uh, thermostat management, pretty, pretty simple trick, but really um, this is just really about being a little more conscious about your, your thermostat settings. Uh, so the old rule of thumb used to be that for every additional degree, degree you turn it up in winter or down in summer, you're increasing your, your energy use by about 10%, depending on the heating system. Um, but generally we sort of say that, you know, if you can get the room into a reasonable position, you know, from a, from a building shell perspective, then you're able to run, particularly in winter, the, the heating system at a lower setting and therefore using less energy use and, and the, the opposite of that in, uh, in summer. Now, insulation is obviously your big one in terms of your thermal, what we call your thermal measures. Um, there's different types of insulation. There's, there's, there's ceiling insulation, wall insulation, underfloor. Your ceiling insulation generally regarded as the first best thing to do. If you haven't got it or hasn't been done for a long time and can be topped up, then looking at your bats, your thick bats that can be put into the roof, uh, that's, that will have immediate impact. Um, your foil stuff, like in the, in the bottom left of the corner of the image there, is more for reflecting the heat back in, in summer. Um, ceiling insulation, I've done ceiling insulation DIY. If you can get into the roof space and you're confident, it can be a DIY project, but you need to be careful and, and be confident that you can do that. Uh, otherwise, you know, obviously it's a, 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 a professionals will provide that for you. Um, it's, it comes at a cost, but it is generally regarded, generally found to be a pretty reasonable cost worth spending. Your wall insulation is harder. Um, there's different technologies for that, but essentially for an existing building, there's no real way to do it without relatively significant cost up front. But if you've done, done a lot of the other insulation measures, then it's worth looking at and getting some quotes. 
the underfloor stuff, I've just done underfloor uh, at my house here. It does depend on the, the structure of the building and of the floor for your typical, you know, timber on stumps kind of floor. As long as there's a bit of clearance, it can actually be quite, quite easy to do. Still costs, and most of the time this is done professionally, um, but makes a, a huge, huge difference. It also makes a difference when it's done room by room. This is something that I've done in my uh, home before, particularly with kids' bedrooms. Um, so you don't have to necessarily look at the whole house, but can look at a part of the house and, uh, you know, look at, you know, again, if you're sort of doing a bit of a room by room approach, can be really worth uh, exploring that option. Um, if you're wondering where the, where the drafts and where the gaps are, thermal imaging cameras are really the way to go. Um, these things are expensive, but you can get them, uh, well, you can borrow them from, from Renew. We, our members are able to, to borrow one. Also, local councils often will have them or sustainability groups, which uh, might loan them out and you can walk around the house for you know, an hour or two and just work out where are the really problematic areas, either in the depths of winter or the, the depths of summer and you can start to focus on where are the uh, other real kind of uh, leaky problems. Um, and sort of the last slide here, just in this section, was just our renter's guide. Um, you know, I've touched on a few things with renters here. There's a lot of other things that renters can do, not just in the kind of heating and even energy space, but waste and water and other, other sustainability aspects as well. We've got a renter's guide to sustainable living on our website, the web address is there. Uh, others others do have these kind of guides and tips as well, but um, would refer you to that if you've got more questions. And also in our one, it's got some approaches that you can use to, to start talking to your landlord about some things that will, you know, will make sense that you might be able to cost share a bit and then actually be able to, to get the, the building into a better space in terms of lower energy use and, and lower costs. Um, and the last section I was going to talk about is really about appliances. So. You know, we've been talking the last, the previous section was about your kind of thermal building shell measures. So making changes to the actual building to try and influence uh, particularly your heating energy use. And also some of that will help with cooling energy use. But most homes still, no matter how thermally efficient they are, they'll still uh, require active heating, uh, particularly in Victoria to some degree. Um, and so, you know, what are the options? Well, first point to make is that there is a gazillion. <laughs> uh, there's there's too many to talk about in the in the kind of last five minutes of this presentation. Um, you'll all be familiar with lots of different types, but um, to run through a few of them, you've got you know electric resistive heaters, uh, individual kind of room fluid gas heaters, uh, oil heaters, a lot of wood burning. I, I know particularly up in the region we're talking to tonight is uh, is relevant. Uh, your kind of floor heating, particularly your gas ducted ones, fairly common in Victoria. Reverse cycle air conditioning, uh, gas wall furnaces, you know, single room, uh, electric plug-in panel heaters, which are becoming more common. And then you start getting into your personal heating devices, either the old ones, your hot water bottles, or some of the newer gadgets, your personal heating and cooling devices, which uh, just actually heat parts of your individual body. Um, it's confusing. But generally we try and categorize things into three main ways. With heating, you're really talking about a whole of house heating system. It might be gas, it might be electric, it could even be wood. Um, or you're talking about individual room heaters. Um, you're just trying to use those to actually control the temperature within a certain room that can be zoned. Or you're really talking about your kind of personal heating devices and the personal heating device market is really going gangbusters and there's a million different gadgets to, to explore there. And some of them, I mean, some of those are, those new gadgets too are very low power, so worth actually considering. And, and in the end, you can be sitting in a very cold room, you're warm, but you're not trying to heat the, the whole room in, in total. Um, what's the most efficient least cost to run? The answer is pretty clear now in terms of either a whole of house or room based system. It really is reverse cycle air conditioning. Um, these have come a long way. They're certainly, you know, four to five times more efficient than, a, than your kind of plug-in panel heaters and they can be six to 12, 13 times more efficient than a gas system depending on how old that gas unit is. Um, they're, they're fully controllable. They can do, yeah, whole of house or, or individual rooms. A lot of people have them and run them for cooling only. If you've got them and they, they're actually a reverse cycle unit, you can run them for heating and they will actually fit to heat an entire room, a reasonable sized room, maybe, you know, 15, 20 square meters or more. 
these things really are the lowest cost way to, to do that and the lowest energy use. Um, obviously, your plug-in panel heaters are, are an option. Uh, much cheaper to buy. Get these things for kind of, you know, three, four hundred bucks from good guys or Harvey Norman. But again, you know, these are a resistive technology. They're, they're still that kind of traditional, uh, yeah, resistive technology with no particular efficiency gain. They're kind of one unit of energy in, one unit out. Kind of similar, really, to the old style kind of bar radiators and oil heaters. Generally, our advice with these is they are good, good for small rooms for a few hours. Um, I, I do use them a lot um, around the house because, you know, they can they can provide uh, maybe a little bit of heat in the mornings or in the evenings, or if I'm working for a couple of hours, that's okay. Um, but if you're gonna be running, you know, for medium to large rooms where you need, you know, six, eight, 10 hours of heating, that, and you've got a number of these around the house, they can really add up both in terms of energy usage and cost. Um, your gas ones are really your, your main alternative to electric. Um, and, you know, they really fall into either their room room by room heaters, so kind of your gas wall furnace there on the bottom or your kind of fluid gas heater, uh, or your, your sort of whole of house ones, your ducted ones, and obviously ducted gas is very common in Victoria. Um, and a lot of those systems are a lot older. Some of the systems are, are newer. The, the older ones do struggle with the age uh, of the burners, the efficiency of those, and the fact that there will be ducts, which, you know, over time ducts get little tears and gaps and start to leak themselves. Um, ones that are kind of 10 to 15 years old and more are probably worth looking at, at least in terms of the ducts and maybe the, the burner itself. Um, your newer ones will, will run more efficiently because they essentially they'll have new ducts and newer burners for a gas unit are a bit more efficient. Um, overall, you know, these things, uh, they are lower efficiency than your reverse cycle aircon units. It sort of does depend on what you have to begin with as to what your options are for changing out. And your individual room heaters, if you've done a lot of other thermal measures, then it, it, it will mean that maybe you don't have to run those individual units quite as hard and not heat every room. And so that, that would hopefully keep the energy costs relatively under control. Um, so I've been talking for a bit over half an hour. I think I'm gonna stop there. I've just got a few, a couple of slides at the end, and this is what people can sort of check out afterwards. If you're sort of wondering, I mean, it, you know, energy efficiency, particularly with heating is, is complex. There are a lot of different options. Some of them are building thermal options. Some of them are appliance options. A really good data source is a study that's, that was done by Sustainability Victoria, uh, which was published late last year. And they actually did retrofits on lots of different homes, I think 60 or 80 homes, and lots of different measures. And they, they looked at the costs and the bill savings and the payback times and the energy savings and also the carbon savings on all these different measures. And they, put them in this table and they rank them by fastest payback time to the longest payback time. Um, and it's worth having a look at uh, that. You know, your, your typical ones that end up at the top of the list, unsurprisingly still your shower heads, swimming pool pumps are, are a big one, you know, ceiling insulation, uh, as we were sort of saying before, draft ceiling and a couple of appliances there, sorry, white goods, clothes washers and refrigerators coming into the mix. So uh, again, there's a web link at the bottom of that last slide really worth checking out if you're looking at different options for your, your place. Uh, and I'll hand back to Rob. Great, thanks Damien, excellent. Um, and thanks to Jay and Keith have added in some questions there in the Q&A. So feel free to add them in as we get through them in the next uh, 10 minutes or so. Um, I might just kick off one with around uh, getting off gas because sort of didn't talk too much about actually disconnecting the whole house once you've switched over to going all electric. That's the kind of general general view these days is that it's, you, in most circumstances, you're better off going all electric? Yeah, look, it, it's certainly our view um, in terms of, you know, the medium long term, if you're going to be in a house and, you know, it's a, there's all these kind of contextual questions, but if the person's going to be in the house the next five, 10 years and, and longer, and you're thinking about, well, how am I actually going to manage energy use in total for this building over the long term? then coming up with a plan to get away from gas is going to help both economically and environmentally. Now, you might not do all of the things today or tomorrow, and you still might have, you know, three uses, you're cooking hot water and, and heating on gas, and your heating is, is a complex one. It depends on a few things, but it's about kind of considering, well, you know, how could I do that? And maybe coming up with a plan that you might implement over a year or two years to then look at transitioning away, because ultimately, uh, yeah, both certainly from a cost perspective, but if you're running at 
if you're putting on solar PV as well, then without question, you're going to be better off in the long term and so the environment moving away from, from gas. Sure. Yeah, we actually removed our ducted gas heating in our uh, 1870s weatherboard house and put in two split systems and actually probably saved about 800 to to $1,000 per year since we've done that. So it's a noticeable difference and I get you know, a little bit of respiratory issues. So the gas ducted heating wasn't great for me. Um, but I did realise recently that a lot of the ducts that, that are still in the floor have actually come away. So the vents were just basically, you know, flowing in cold air from underneath the underneath the floor. And the ducts weren't actually attached anymore. So now that's sealed and sorted. I have, I have little towels uh, wedged in mine. <laughs> that's right. Um, so I've got a question from Jay saying, if someone has solar PV and a traditional electric hot water system, uh, so what options do they have to take advantage of the solar to heat the water? Yeah, it's, that's a really interesting question now. So for a long time, um, environmental groups like ourselves have been very resistant to kind of electric storage as a long-term kind of hot water option because electric storage is resistive and it, it, it ends up with more energy use. But with, with the power of solar PV now, the amount of energy that you can get from a solar PV system, what we're finding is you can, if you have an existing electric storage uh, hot water system, you can put a timer on those, you can run them during the day, and provided the PV system is large enough and you know the hot water demand is, is reasonable, then you can actually cover most of that uh, electricity usage with the hot, from the hot water system with your solar PV system. Um, the best way to do it is really to do a little bit of analysis first. This is actually what we do do in the consults, do a little bit of modeling first just to make sure that, that the, this kind of system design that you've got is right. Um, but increasingly, yeah, I mean, solar, just the capacity of solar now, it's, it's so big that you can actually start to cover electric storage loads. Great. Um, and another good question from Keith that is, is often a, a view that's put forward by um, plumbers and electricians themselves sometimes that about heat pumps and their use in central Victoria and maybe Canberra where temperatures get very, you know, below zero quite often. So how, how effective are they in those environments and how confident can you be before committing to a purchase? Yeah, well, probably the best answer I could give is a, is a personal one. So I lived for three years in Tewton, a little town outside Castle Main, uh, up until about two years ago. Uh, and we had a heat pump hot water system and a solar PV system on the roof. Uh, the heat pump, look, most of the good heat pumps on the market, they're, they're rated now down to minus 10 degrees. And of course, we were running, I was running my one. It was kicking off at 10 a.m. each day. It didn't run overnight, it ran during the day to take advantage of the solar PV energy. Um, didn't have an issue, knew, knew many, many, many people around that region with, with heat pumps. And yeah, that, that issue of cold climate conditions has really fallen away as an issue. And I mean, we're talking about a technology that is used in Japan and used in lots of parts of Europe where, and they are run overnight and they run for domestic hot water or hydronic heating systems. And so really the cold climate the argument has kind of fallen away. Sort of 10 years ago or so for us, we were a bit sus on that point, but the last five, six years, we're quite comfortable with those operating in, in Australian cold climate conditions. Yeah, I think similar circumstance for us. I think the only issue we've had is on maybe really frosty mornings. It takes a little bit of time for it to, to get going in terms of the actual, the reverse cycle air conditioners this is, not the hot water systems. Yeah. Um, so I think I put that partly down to the, the outdoor unit being on the roof and quite exposed, and particularly in summer as well. So it's consideration of that aspect too when you're getting someone to install it think about you know perhaps the best place to put those outdoor units and, yeah um, so another question here from someone who's got a 12 year old home in central vic with non-zoned gas heating and about cooling ceiling fans in all bedrooms solar hot water and one and a half kilowatt panels considering installing a split system in the main kitchen living dining to not have to use the original heating cooling units and i guess they're just got, wanting to get a sense of the cost and energy savings after doing that and sorry, what, what was the existing system? I missed that at the start. A, a one and a half kilowatt solar system. Uh, there's non-zoned gas heating, so gas throughout the whole house, but yeah. they're considering instead of running that using the, a split system instead. Yeah, okay. Um, look, if it's, if it's an individual room, some of the modeling we've done, you know, the cost can be sort of in the, you know, maybe 150 to $300 range if you're talking about, I'm talking about a primary heating space room, so a living space, not, 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 a, not a bedroom, but a room that's frequently used. Um, you know, it will depend on what size in and obviously how much the existing heating system is, gas heating system is used, but it, it can be in, in that range. If you, 
if it's a much larger energy usage that you've got with the existing system, then those savings will be bigger. Um, so, yeah. Yep. Um, there's, that's it from the ones on, online and we're getting pretty close to eight o'clock. I suppose just to finish up with Damien, it's, it's often hard to work out, you know, which order to do things when you're considering all the things you could do in your house. And I know I've had that problem with, you know, I've taken off all of our web, weather boards to insulate the walls, but probably should have done the windows while I was doing that. But, you know, now we're considering putting double glazed windows in as well. So there's all these things that you kind of need to think about ahead of time. Is there any kind of suggestions you guys usually provide people about, you know, yeah, look, practical... I mean, yeah, a lot of it does come back to budget. What, what, what? You know, if if you can handle a, you know, one or two more major items, then okay, that opens up quite a lot of opportunities. If you've got to sort of do small things first, then it really is concentrating on those the draft ceiling options, and particularly, you know, ceiling insulation is still a very good, good way, good way to go. And, and particularly, you know, you, you kind of have that issue where it's it's both about the cost but also it's often about actually the, the comfort of the building as well and so you try to match kind of multiple objectives there um, but you know if you've I mean without a shadow of a doubt if it's if you've got the cash and it's purely about the economics nothing beats solar PV nothing nothing I mean solar PV a medium to larger system size will save more generally more than a thousand bucks a year and can be closer to two and nothing really saves that whopping amount of <laughs> money. So if that's the thing that, that kind of, you, you want a quick payback on something that you, you can get on to do other things, and that's probably one of the first things you do. But um, yeah, we're, I mean, again, for me, it would just come back to that, you know, what are your major uses? And if it's a Victorian home, most of the time, it's gonna be heating and hot water. So it's, it's really concentrating on, on those two. Yep, and I one of the last things I did was draft proof my windows, and I wish I'd done that first because that would have been amazing the difference that that's actually provided. So I've done all the, all the hard stuff first, and then get to the easy stuff last. Um, so just a final thank you to Damien for for that presentation, and to everyone else for logging on and finding your way into this session, and to Doug from Renew who's been managing the chat and the Q and A. Um, just a final plug as well, if you are interested in Facebook and you are on Facebook, there is the My Fish and Electric Home, which is really great, you know, a group of people that are really committed to um, making their house and apartments as efficient as possible. So definitely a good resource to tap into. Um, and obviously Renew, the organisation itself, is, is definitely worth subscribing to. A lot of great resources there and people you can tap into. So thank you once again and uh, enjoy your evening. Thanks, everyone.